for the last few weeks and dealing with a subject that it took me half of my life to put together and I'm so excited about it until I'm going to have to share a bit more with you this morning. I was just sitting there trying to figure out how to do it. You know, I know how it is in my head, but I am not going to follow this script as I have it here because I have it laid out for an hour's presentation, so I'll just pull some things out of that. That subject that I'm talking about is the least recognized ways God speaks and communicates with us. You know, I was, didn't have anybody to teach me how God talks to us, you know, so that I could understand it. And through the years, people still have trouble understanding how God communicates with you. But he does. He communicates with you day by day. He communicates with you continuously. The only problem is that we don't know how to listen. I said to you, you know what, I'm, I'm approaching this a little differently. I'm a teacher. So I've also learned how to be led by the Spirit. So I don't necessarily have to go the same way all the time. But I want to point out to you up front that God speaks to you through his word. Amen. And I'm, I'm really concerned because if we're in September, young people are ready to go away to school. That was the most exciting time in my life. It's when I got old enough to go to school. And I'm having a little difficulty as I look at Flint. We're up to about 69% dropout. That's future trouble. There's no way, young people, for you to believe that you can't graduate from high school. Because if you graduate from high school, you will see some avenues to some greater things. God wants you prosperous. God is not poor. But God can't cause you to be prosperous if you don't do it according to the way he said do it. When you get off track and go in a different way to God, he can't help you. God put a will in you. And that is you can say yes and no. You understand? That's right. He put a will. We saw that from the Garden of Eden, which I'll show, since it jumped in my head, I'll, I'll deal with that right now. God created a Garden of Eden. And that's a paradise. That means everything was put in that Garden of Eden. They didn't even have to talk. No crime. And no sin. But he gave Adam a will, didn't he? God looked at him one day and says, he's alone. I'm going to create him a helper. That's the next subject I've been working on. I got it together. I just didn't bring it. We got to talk about marriage. When God created marriage, the term to divorce wasn't even in existence. We have 79% divorce in the church. Something wrong with that. You understand what I'm saying? But in that Garden of Eden, he says, I'm going to create a helper. He had given Adam a job. And he saw that he was alone. And he took a rib out of him, according to the Bible, which is a miracle. You don't have to try to explain a miracle. It's contrary to anything that makes sense. The Bible says when he, after he created that Garden of Eden, he created Adam, created a man, put him in that garden. Then he says he took that rib and he 
formed the woman and brought her to Adam. He didn't go back to the soil. And he says, Adam, this is your helper. What are you going to call her? Well, Adam said, she's bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Notice by the time he got down there, Adam had already named everything that God had created, including a snake, when he got to that point. Isn't that something? That means he had a job, didn't he? Okay. But notice, as the brother said this morning, God is good. He is. He instructed Adam. He says, Adam, I feel this garden of trees of every kind, of everything that you need for meat. He had already told a pre-edemic generation the same thing. Okay? But he didn't breathe the breath of life into them. He breathed the breath of life into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. Spirit, will. That's where that will came from. And then he brought this helper to him. He instructed her. Because I read it very plainly. He instructed his helper. There are certain things that we just don't do in here. And one of them is, is there's a tree in the middle of the garden that we shouldn't eat of. She understood that. But you'll find that Satan had already fallen billions of years before that and gone against God. So he was a sinful adversary before he came into the garden. He had already fallen. Sin was already created into the angelic order. But note at this point, Adam had not sinned. <laughs> Adam had not sinned at this time. But you'll find that Satan is also an imposter, isn't he? He knows how to create himself and he looked like something else. And that's what he did. He went and got and formed himself and got into the body of a serpent. And that serpent met Eve, Adam's helper. And he challenged her and says, did God say that we shouldn't eat some of these trees in here? And this is how I know Adam had done his job. She said, yes, there's one we shouldn't eat of. And say we shouldn't even touch it. But you see, Adam is an, an uh, imposter. He's an adversary to God. First thing that came out of his mouth, he says, God knows that uh, if you eat of that tree, you become wise like him. You will not die. But one of the things that Eve hadn't been around long enough to know that God doesn't make suggestions. And I want to say to those of you here today, God still doesn't make a suggestion. If God says anything, it's a commandment, not a suggestion. When God said, don't eat, that's a commandment. And when the old imposter came up and went against God, that's how you know when something is from God or when something is from the devil, is that it will go against God's word. Yes, sir. And the mere fact that he said that you will not die, you become wise like him, that was a lie. Yes, sir. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And that was a deception. Yes, sir. And did you realize Satan is still deceiving people? Yes, sir. Yes. He's just deceiving people. Yes, but note you have the same choice, the same will, the same soul, the capacity to say yes or no. You understand? And if you don't say no to satanic attacks upon you, then you wind up just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that's where we are right now. When she took of that fruit. And the Bible says she took of it and she gave it to her husband who was with her. Now they both have violated or gone against God's will. And my subject this morning, as I said, the least recognized ways God communicates with you. 
Well, watch God start communicating with Adam, with Eve, and the devil who was the snake. <laughs> watch this. After they had violated God's law, God said to the serpent, you are cursed beyond all of the cattle and all of the beasts of the field. Because of what you've done, you will crawl on your belly for the rest of your days. And you will eat the dust of the ground. God was talking or communicating with Satan. Did you get that point? All right? Then he looked at the woman. He says, for what you have done, I'm going to increase the sorrows in your conception and your childbearing. And not only that, you're going to be subjected to your husband. Mm -hmm. Women, you were not even subjected to a man until that point. You get what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Now, if there's anybody in here who says that God does not communicate with a woman, Eve was a woman. Amen. This Bible says, many he talked to Eve. Yeah. Am I coming over to you? Don't let anybody tell you God can't talk to a woman or God can't call a woman. It's because they have not read this. Right. Did you understand what I'm saying? I got two of them under control of heaven. He talked to the devil and he talked to the woman. And he's going to talk to Adam. He says, Adam, because you listened to the helper, and you went against what I told you, what I commanded you not. Yes. Mm -hmm. Notice, God had him set up the, the situation. Was, it was a paradise. He didn't have to toil. But from this point, God said, you're going to have to live by the sweat of your brow. Yes, God was talking to Adam right there. Yes, He's talking to you and me. I had to get a little shout now, that's all. Throw right. yeah. so break there just a little bit. All right? I'm under control now. He talked to Adam. And the thing that bothered me through the years, Adam was the first one to sin into the human order. Satan had already sinned into the angelic order. Yeah. He'd already been thrown out of heaven into the earth. Right. And billions of angels with him before he even showed up in the garden. Yeah. But now that sin because of Adam. Note that God didn't say a thing to the woman because he, he directed Adam. Right. Adam was the leader. Yeah. Adam was the one he instructed. Yeah. And Adam was responsible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so therefore this is why God told Adam no more free lunches. Did you all get that? Adam didn't even have to work for his lunch. Up until that point right there. Well, now I have shown you that God speaks to Eve, spoke to Eve, spoke to Adam, and he spoke to the devil. That ought to be a message right there. Now, if God will speak to the devil, what's going to make you think that he's not going to speak to you? So the point I'm getting down to that God speaks to everyone whether you listen to him or not. It just took me a long time to understand. And when I discovered that God had been talking to me from a little boy, I just didn't know how to listen to him. Didn't you understand what I'm saying? Did I give you the ways that God communicates with us this morning? He speaks to you through his word. Speaks through you through visions, through dreams. He speaks through you through answer prayers. And he speaks through you through the Holy Spirit. So I don't know how much time I got, but just let me start showing you something, how God has spoken to me through the years. Now, if anybody in here who thinks God has not been speaking to you, it's because you have not done what he said. Okay? God said men should always pray. Is that right? That means woman, yeah. female man, yeah. should pray. And if you pray to the God I know, God will answer you. I was a little boy. I said, Lord, see, I learned something about prayer, but I didn't know 
uh, you know, that God talks to me that way. I said, I don't want my parents to die while I'm young. God answered that prayer. I was grown, thank you, had a wife and kids of my own before my parents went on. And later on, as I began to understand God, he was talking to me. So if you've ever had a prayer answered, God was talking to you. You understand what I'm saying? I was a little boy. I couldn't have been more than six when I prayed that prayer. Certainly no one ate. Now I'm 17 years old. I'm in college. So, Lord, I'm not looking for a wife. But now when I get one, give me one that I can live with. God has answered that prayer. At 21, God gave me my wife, and this I'm in my 56th year with her. It hasn't been a struggle. She's helped me do everything that I've tried to do. Amen. Divorce hasn't ever come into my mind in 56 years. Amen. Did you hear what I say? Yes, we haven't had no struggle. Amen. You understand, people, well, it has been the best thing that could have happened to me. Help me do everything that I've tried to do. God answered that prayer. When you get a wife, children come on. You don't have to ask that question. Yes. I said, Lord, now you've given me this family. You give me the resources. I'll help them. Some of you know that I was in tennis. I was a tennis family, right? Mm -hmm. I put my kids in the tennis, and you may not know how much it costs. But to keep a 12-year-old in tennis for a year, you doing the coaching, it'll cost you over $60,000 a year. I had four in there. And over a period of 25 years, I spent over a million dollars, probably two, and never missed paying a bill. God gave me the resources. Did you hear what I'm saying? I'm not up here just talking anything. God answers your prayer, and when he answers your prayer, he's talking to you. Did you hear what I'm saying? We travel to every nation in this country, in the world. We travel millions of miles by plane. Thank you, I see you. And what I'm trying to tell you is, I said, now Lord, you gotta take care of me. When I say me, my family. Yeah. Out of all of those millions of miles we flew, we never had a mishap anywhere. Praise Praise that was another answered prayer. Praise I drove all over this country Praise with my youngsters. We never even had a flat tire. Lord. I'm trying to tell you, if you pray, God will answer you. You understand what I'm saying? I don't owe anybody anything this morning that I can't pay right out of my pocket. I'm not in debt. I'm saying to you, you ain't got no business being in debt if you do the right thing. And all of you young people here, let me tell you something. Stay in school. Go to school. Go in there to learn. Don't get thrown out. Because if you get suspended, I saw the suspension statistics in 2013. 20,000 people that look like me in this town suspended. Something is wrong with that. Amen. Go in there and behave and learn. Let me tell you something. My education has been the most important thing that ever happened to me. It made me a better husband. It made me a better parent. It made me a teacher to do what I'm doing right now. I couldn't teach this unless I had some educational background. That's why I can write. I stayed in school. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I can speak because I kept trying. Don't drop out of school. Did you hear what I say? My 20 minutes over. But you know, I at least got an hour here for you. She told me that I should quit, so I'm going to quit. I thank you. Let me give you some background scriptures to get us started. Please take note. The first scripture I'd like to give you is Joel 2 and 28. And it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. 
Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Did you get that? Took me half of my life to understand that verse. Genesis 2.16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's a commandment, isn't it? Genesis 3 and 1 says, Now the serpent, in this case it could have said the devil because he was an imposter. So he's taken on the likeness of a serpent, so he is a serpent here. Was the most subtle, was most subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he, the serpent, said unto the woman, Yea, has ye has had, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not die. And that was the first lie in all of the Bible. Right there. Did you learn something? That was the first lie. Ye shall not die. Therefore my subject shall be the least recognized ways God communicates with mankind. Did you get that? The least recognized ways that God communicates with you and me. Did you get that? Let me put it another way. There are a few things in, the, in your life that's more important to you than to understand how God communicates with you. I don't know if anything else could be more important than that. Than to know, you and I to know, that God, how God communicates with you. But you know, I lived a long time before I knew how to hear God. I didn't know how to listen to him. I didn't know how to hear him. No one had taught me. And since I have a beautiful audience here this morning, some of you may be the same way. But you will not leave here this morning without knowing that God speaks to you. And I want to put it out right now, God speaks to everyone, whether you listen to him or not. Isn't that interesting? It took me a long time to understand that. But my mistake was is that I tried to hear him with my audible, my carnal, my physical ears. You got to understand that God is a spirit, isn't he? So therefore, when he speaks to you, he will communicate with you spirit to spirit. He communicates with your spirit. That's why we can get confused sometimes and don't know when God is speaking to us. So I have three examples that I want to give you up front to show you how God communicated with the first people whom he put in the garden. And since God makes no difference between us, it means that he'll communicate with all of us, that should say to you and me that God communicates with you and me the same way. The Bible tells us that that serpent who is the devil, deceived Eve, and she did indeed eat of the tree that God had commanded Adam, and they'd eat thereof. And the Bible says, not only did she eat, but she gave it to her husband who was with her. 
Now they both have violated God's commandment. And let me share something with you here. God has never made a suggestion. You may not have known that. If God speaks, it's a commandment, yeah. non-negotiable. Wow. I may come in and, and say to Pastor Wheeler that, Pastor Wheeler, well, I, I suggest that we might consider this because this is not my domain. So I have to make it as a suggestion, don't I? But when God speaks, he does not make suggestions. So when he says, don't eat, it was a commandment, non-negotiable. You got to understand that. And that's the predicament they, they found themselves in. Let me point out something else. Note my subject was the least recommended or recognized ways that God communicates with us. That suggests that something drops through the crack on some of us, doesn't it? Is that some of us don't get it, do we? But I want to tell you God speaks to all of us whether you get it or not. So now let me give you any examples of how God talked to the first people whom he put in the garden from that scenario that we built, developed based on the scriptures that I gave you. Eve was the first person. We'll take a look at her. When that serpent deceived her and she ate of the fruit, she didn't know that there was a judgment coming on. But that judgment that was coming on to her, to woman, God said to her that I will greatly increase your sorrow in childbearing. And not only that, you will be subjected to your husband from now on. Women, you were not even subjected to a man until then. And that's Genesis 3.16 if you want to make a note of that. Then God spoke to the serpent. He said, for what you have done, you are going to crawl up on your belly for the rest of your days and eat the dust of the ground. Amen. Judgment. The Lord indeed was speaking to Satan, who was a serpent. Then he spoke to Adam. He says, Adam, because you listened to your wife and didn't heed my commandment not to eat. He said, there will be no more free lunches. <laughs> now that was my language. You see, up until that point, everything was provided for Adam. He didn't have to toil. But he said, from now on, Adam, you'll have to work and live by the sweat of your own brow. And did you realize that that curse or that judgment was passed down through generations to us today? Amen. Had they not gone against God at that point? Oh, man, I can't imagine what the situation would be. We wouldn't have to work and toil and no sickness, no sin, no hostility. The garden was a paradise. There was no sin there. Until, but notice, let me point this out to you. When the devil said that you will not die, he was already a fallen angel. He was already fallen, thrown out of heaven into the earth. He was already judged. He will go to the pit and eventually be thrown into hell fire from that judgment. So he was already fallen. So he just kept the bad stuff going on. Do you get that? Now, that was just kind of like setting you up so that you will understand that God speaks to everyone. He spoke to Adam, he spoke to Eve, he spoke to the devil. Amen. Then what would make you think then that God is not going to speak to you? If God speaks to the devil, he has to speak to you and me. Amen. Isn't that crown? Isn't that something? So now let me share something with you to help you, those of you for the first time being here. God speaks through his word. This is his word. If you read it, he's speaking to you. God speaks through circumstances. God speaks through angels, which I'll share with you as I go. 
God speaks through dreams and visions. God speaks to you through answered prayers. Is there anybody in here, by show of hands, would you please let me see your hand if God has ever answered a prayer for you? God was communicating with you. That's the evidence right there. And I'm going to share with you this morning some prayers that I've prayed through the years where I know and you and I'll show you the evidence that he answered me. God was communicating with you. But as a young man, no one had taught me that. I didn't know. I didn't understand that. You understand that? Another thing, when Jesus went to the cross, went to the grave, or to the tomb, and rose again, guess he's, first thing he says is, I'm going out of here, but I'm going to send you another comforter. Did you remember that? Well, that another comforter was the Holy Spirit. Did you realize that if you were born again, it was the Holy Spirit that accepted your spirit and ushered you into the kingdom of God? He became your constant companion from that point. The Holy Spirit is living within you from that point. So when that spirit talks to you and tells you when you want to do something inappropriately, and it says, no, you shouldn't do that. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. God, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. The Holy Spirit is saying, I want to be your comforter, didn't he? I want to be your guide. I want to be your leader. I want to be your paraclete. Paraclete is someone who walks beside you. He paracletus, that's what that means. So the Holy Spirit has been walking with you from the day that you were born again. He's your constant companion. So and if he ever advised you to do or not to do something, that was God speaking to you. Are we together this morning? Come on with it. Come on with it. You understand what I'm saying? There's no such thing as God does not speak to you. It's just we have got to tune up our spiritual ear and listen to him so that we'll know when the Lord is speaking to us and we ought to abide by accordingly. Well, let me get into some other dimensions here to help us understand something. I said he speaks to you through dreams and visions. You understand? That's, a, that's, that's some powerful stuff. When we speak in terms of dreams and visions, we're talking about images and pictures and situations that God would put into your spirit while you sleep. And you can get up the next day and talk to people and say, this is what happened to me. That's God speaking to you through a dream or a vision. You see, the only difference in a vision and a dream is that a dream is short term. And a vision is long term. But they are both given to you through your spirit man. And you have to understand that when God is talking to you through your spirit man, you can even be asleep. God can give you a vision even when you're walking along the road too. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Now, let me show you something else to help us understand the difference between a dream and a vision, and we kind of learn a little bit about that in Isaiah 46 and 10. Please make a note of it. And this is what God says. He says, I am God, and there's none like me. I set the end from the beginning. Did you all get that? That's the essence of what happens with a dream, I mean with a vision. He'll set the end from the beginning. God knows knew even before you were conceived in the mother's womb what you would be at the end of your life. Amen. That's the reason he said, I'll set it right now from the beginning and I know what the end is going to be. Right. And so when he brings you on the scene, he has already completed what you have got to do when he gives you the assignment. That's a vision. That's a vision. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Now, that verse where I read to you that Old men will dream dreams. Young men will dream, uh, will, will see visions. Now watch this. If you're a young person, you can live out the dream of vision. But if you're an old person, 
God will show you what you could have been or what you should have been because it's in the past now. So that's what it means when it says old men will have dreams and young men will see visions. Do you get to that? Are you with me on that? Well, that's how you understand the difference between a dream and a vision. Visions are long-term and dreams are short-term. Are we together on that? Now let me just give you some examples from the Bible now to help us understand how God has communicated with his people through the years. And he'll do you the same way if you will listen. Are we together on that? The first person I want to deal with is Abram. That is before he became Abraham. Abram and his wife Sarah and his supporters were advised by God to go toward the land of Egypt to escape a famine. And if you want to know what that is, that's Genesis 21 through 6, if you want to read it after today. And when they arrived in a city by the name of Gerar, Sarah and Abraham, Abe had, Abram then, had made a decision and said, listen, I'm going to, we're going to have to say that you're my sister. And they agreed. And so when they got to Gerar, and old Abimelech looked at Sarah, I said, just take her and bring her in. She's going to be a part of my harem wives. And the Bible tells me that the very night Abimelech did that, God came to him in a dream and said, Abimelech, you are a dead man. He says, I know you did this out of the integrity of your heart, but I cause you not to sin against me. The woman that you have brought into your harem is a man's wife. And he says, I don't want you to touch her, but rather return her to her husband. Did you hear what I'm saying? Isn't it interesting that Abimelech obeyed God? Because in that dream, he told him, says, if you touch her, not only are you going to die, but your whole harem will die. Did you hear what I'm saying? So Abimelech returned her back to Abraham. You understand what I'm saying? So therefore, it's important to obey God, isn't it? This will happen to you the same way. So he almost made a mistake. But because God went to him in a vision, and he was not hard-headed, and he gave her up and gave her back to Abraham, and he went on. That was, not, that was before he became the father of faith, by the way. The father of the faithful. I don't know why he didn't have it at that time, but he should have. God saved him right there. Now, if you go to Genesis 15 and 1, the Lord said to Abram again, he gave him a vision this time, okay? And he said to Abram, I'm your shield and I'm your exceeding great reward. I want to tell you something, Abraham was approaching 100 years old by now. That old boy was getting old. Abraham came back at him and said, listen, you know what? I'm childless. And not only that, I'm an old man. So what is this you're talking about? You want to do something for me? God took Abraham out under the heavens and said, look up. Whew. God getting himself under control. So look up, Abraham. He says, if you can count the stars, that's the way your descendants are going to be. That's a vision. That was a long time ahead. So that's the way your, that's the way your descendants are going to be. Did you realize Abraham believed that? Abraham believed that, and he was justified by his faith. Great God. That's why I was almost a shout. I was seeing what was in this page. Did you hear what I'm saying? He said, that's the way your seed is going to be, Abraham. He was approaching 100 years old. Did you realize that came to pass? I can tell you up front, that came to pass. Do you understand what I'm saying? Abraham was justified by faith. Do you know when you are justified? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and your sins are forgiven, you are justified right there. It's called born again. Your slate is clean. You can walk down before God and say, hello, Lord, here I am. But until then, you have no part with him because you're still sin-ridden. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, that, that was the vision that he gave him because those... Those seed came on hundreds of years in the future, and I want to give you another vision that he gave Abe. 
And make a note of Genesis 15 and 12. In this vision, God had a big sleep to fall upon Abram. And Abraham began to dream. He said, Abraham, your seed is going to be taken into a strange land. And he says, I'm going to judge those who will take them into slavery. And he said, they're going to be in there for 400 years. And he says, none of that, but when they are delivered out of there, they will have an abundance of wealth. Did you realize that was hundreds of years? And I'll just give you a little quick rundown to show you. Abraham had Isaac. Then he had Jacob. You see, then there was Esau and Jacob, rather. Isaac had Esau and Jacob. Jacob had Joseph and 12 other brothers. Joseph was sold into slavery, wasn't he? He became a ruler down there, didn't he? He had to come back to Canaan land to pick up Jacob and 70 of his relatives some years later, didn't he? Brought them to Egypt, and it is from that 70 that the children of Israel multiplied over 400 years to over 3 million. That was Abraham's seed. That was the group that was taken into uh, Egypt for 400 years into slavery. And when they were delivered out of there, Abraham saw this hundred years later. They had so much gold, they had to take it out of their own pack mules. Did you hear what I'm saying? When he took you know when Moses brought them across the Red Sea? They were not poor. The Egyptians gave them so much gold and cattle and wealth. They were rich. And I'll ask you a question to kind of open up your mind. Why do you think they got their gold to build a golden calf? Hadn't thought about that, had you? They brought it out of Egypt. It had been given to them. They, you allow me to say this, they were just stupid. And went against God and built a calf and start worshiping that calf when God had to deliver them. Amen. So I say to Flint this morning, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? If God has delivered you all of this time and you'll start serving an idol, something is wrong somewhere. I'll tell you what that something is. That's the devil that's gotten into you. He's pers you hear? Huh? That's that same devil that was in the garden, the serpent. He's conned you to go against God. Right. And if you go against God, you're getting in bad, bad place. You understand what I'm saying? You're getting in a bad place. All right? Let me go a little further here. Are you with me on that? I want to tell you something else. Now, this one is oh, it's a little shouting time. Uh, I want to talk about Solomon, the vision God gave Solomon. You understand? This was David's son. Did you realize when he was appointed king, he was only eight years old? God came to him in a dream and said to Solomon, said, now Solomon, what do, you, what do you want me to give you? I love this young man. Out of all of the Bible, he's one of my favorites. And this is, well, listen to this carefully. Solomon was a young man, eight years old. And he says here, Lord, I'm aware of the great mercy that you showed my father David when he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart. Did you all get that? He says, I'm aware of all of this. You preserved this throne, and now you have given me the opportunity to become king of that same throne. And this boy says, Lord, if there's anything you want to give me, just give me an understanding to make a judgment of right and wrong. So that's all I want. And that's, he asked for wisdom. Thank you. He asked for wisdom. Just give me the wisdom. That's the reason I love this kid. At eight years old. He said, that's all I want. Well, God not only gave him that, but he also gave him riches. He also gave him abundance of wealth. He also made him the wisest man of his day. Did you understand? Well, that's the way God will do you and me. If you obey him, he will dump everything on you, health and wealth. You understand? Now, let me, let me point something out to you. You may not know it, but Flint right now, according to the report, Flint right now is the second 
most impoverished city in the nation behind Youngtown, Ohio, right now. And that's where it has fallen since General Motors moved out of this town. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, well, just like this nation here, if we do the right thing and teach this Bible and obey it, well, God will produce that same health and wealth in Flint today. But we got to do it. We got to do it. You understand? But the problem we're having here is, is that we're not doing it. I'm seeing murder. I'm seeing rape. I'm seeing a lot of foolishness. Thank you. You understand? So I'm saying if we do what God says, I'll tell you, if we do what God says, God will bless this town just like it did something. It, it, these people. Well, now let me share something else just personal. Now, oh, you get to this. I said to you, for those of you, I'll fast forward them because I'm down to three minutes. God answers prayers. And if God has ever answered a prayer for you, he was speaking to you. Well, I want to share something with you to let you know I can talk like David. I can talk like Abraham. I can talk like Isaac. I can talk like all of those boys. I'm 76 years old. God has allowed me to do the same thing. And that's why I can talk like what I'm ready to share with you right now. Okay? I was a little boy. Couldn't be more than six or eight. I prayed to God. I said, I don't want my parents to die while I'm young. God answered that prayer. I was married and had children of my own before my parents went on. That's why I know he answered that. Did you hear what I'm saying? That is one of them. I'm a young kid, 17 years old in college. I said, Lord, I got two or three things, another one jumped into my head there, another prayer. I said, Lord, now, I'm not looking for a wife. I said, now, but when I find one, uh, I want somebody I can live with. And uh, I said, uh, I'm 18. I couldn't be more than 18. Well, God gave me my wife at 21. Right now, I'm in my 55th year, and in December, I will be 56 years with that same woman, and she's the best thing that could have happened to me. God answered that prayer. I talked to him a little bit more. I said, now, Lord, I ain't had no class in choosing a wife. I ain't been around, although my mother and father lived 53 years, so I did have some up ahead of me to know that it could be done. But that's the way I was talking to him. He answered that prayer for me. You understand what I'm saying? Now, let me point out something else. I grew up in a farm community. Let me show you something else. I, nobody in my family, nobody in my community, black or white, that are going away to college. I said, God, you've got to let this happen to me. you got to let it happen for me. All right? At 17, I was on the campus. At 21, I was in graduate school. I ran through all that stuff like water through a pipe. God answered that prayer for me. All right? All right? I want to say to you young people here, Sprint is in a tough place, but don't you drop out of school. That's your breakthrough. When I walked across that stage and earned those degrees, when they gave me, that was my breakthrough. Every town, every city I've stopped in, they want to give me a job. God gave me a job right here in this town. He gave me a vision. I was out hitting ball, uh, tennis balls, 8 o'clock in the morning. And it said, go to Flint, Michigan. I was employed by the University of New York. I see you. Thank you. By the University of New York. And I went to house, told my wife, said, I'm going to Flint, Michigan. My brother-in-law lives here. He's a son with your education. You, you can get a job. I came in down to GMI, which is Kettering now, at 8 o'clock in the morning. They didn't even know I was coming. I walked in and they started an interview at 8 o'clock and made me an offer before noon. I took the job and worked the next 20 years. You all didn't hear that, did you? I was played, paid in the top 29% of the corporate world. I retired at 50. I haven't worked for anybody else but myself and my children from now to now. You understand? God had given me enough resources to do that, and I'm not broke. And if you're broke, it is your fault. Get that. If you're broke, it's your fault. If you do what this Bible says, I'm gonna give young people, listen to me. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. 
our worksmen that need us not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. That means your academic study. Stay in school, that's your breakthrough. And if you develop a marketable skill, you can get a job anywhere. Did you hear what I'm saying? Now, let me give you one more thing here. I got so it's too much here. I just want to give you more. But some of you know that I was a tennis person, right? Black folk don't play tennis, do they? But anyway, I was in tennis, put my kids into tennis, and as you may not know, to keep a 12-year-old into tennis for one year, it cost you $60,000, and you doing the coaching. I had four, all right? I put four in there, and I never missed paying a bill. Because I said, God, you've given me these kids, now you give me the resources, and I'll help them. Yes. We travel to every nation in the world. We travel millions of miles. Did you hear what I'm saying? And I said to God, now wait a minute, we got to travel here by plane, you got to protect me. Did you realize we didn't have a mishap in 25 years? Did you also realize that over a period of 25 years, I spent well over a million dollars, maybe two. I never missed paying a bill. You understand? God gave me that resources, and I did what I said. So when you pray to God, he will answer you. Did you hear what I'm saying? Do what he says, and God will bless you. And that's the reason I told you, I retired at 50, and I'm still not broke. Did you hear what I'm saying? I'll never see a broke day in my life. Thank you.